said something very interesting just then. I don't know if you caught it. Don't let this time be wasted. If you're here this morning, I hope you're prayed up. I don't know if you do this, but I prep for when I do things. For example, for example, if I'm coming to church, I'm praying on the way to church. Lord, give, my, give me a soft heart. Prepare me. I want to hear something today. and I, Give me ears to hear it, and I pray it all the time. Give me ears to hear and a soft heart to enact what I'm hearing. And, and if you're here and you're doing it out of rote, like just you're, kind of, you're in church because, well, that's what we do Sundays. You, you go to church. If you're doing it out of routine, that's a waste of time. You say, well, my wife dragged me. I have to come. That's a waste of time. Now, wives, keep dragging them out. It's good. Husbands, keep dragging them, your wife out. It's good. Keep dragging your kids out. It's good. Listen, until my kids are out of the house, they're coming to church. Period. Right? They may be a little lumped up. <laughs> they may look a little bruised because I had to get them here, but they'll be here. I don't want to waste time when we're here. I hope that during worship, you don't think that's the warm-up. Did anybody feel like way? When I, many times, especially since I've had an experience of leading worship for years, it's like people were trying to like warm up. And no, when you get here in the morning on Sunday, be warmed up. Be warmed up. Pray, God, I'm ready. That way when you come into worship, you're ready to worship. You're ready to say amen. I usually find song number one, there's not a lot of amens, not a lot of motion. Song number two, a few people are saying amen and lifting their hands maybe. If you're super spiritual, you're lifting both hands. By the third song, people are finally into it. It doesn't have to be that way. You can start worshiping from song number one. What a novel idea. What a good idea. Let's not waste time. Amen. Let's move on here. I have a couple things I need to, to share with you. Uh, now, my wife texted it to me, so um, I'm going to read it right off my phone, which I don't like doing. But I don't have a choice. <laughs> so this Tuesday night, game night. How many of you would say I'm a competitive person? Raise your hand. Okay. Stay home. We don't want any fights breaking out. No, um, I'm kidding. Um, my wife and I used to play games all the time. And we enjoy that. And she's competitive. She cheats. And, and, and so we don't play as much as we used to. But um, Jaden, you know I'm right, right? Yeah. You could back me. See, he said, yeah, you could back me up. Um, but we're going to have a good time, Tuesday, 6 to 8 o'clock. Bring your favorite board game. Uh, bring your, your favorite person that you want to beat. Bring them as well. And I think it'll be a good time. I think it'll be a time for us to enjoy ourselves and, and have a time of fellowship. Uh, amen. The youth. First of all, I want to say the youth are growing. And I'm so glad to see that. I'm excited to see that. Um, will, you keep, will you keep Abner and Amy in prayer? Pastoring youth is not an easy thing. It's like wrangling cats. You probably know that if you have kids, right? And, and they do a great job of creating this air of excitement, and the youth love them. And, uh, and I appreciate Abner and Amy so much. Um, it's, it's hard to find a good youth pastor, but they have a heart for the youth. They have a heart for your little ones, for your kids. I so appreciate that. We're blessed by them. I want you to know that. Matter of fact, I'd encourage you, when you see them in the hall or in the foyer or whatever, let them know, hey, you're doing a good job, and I'm praying for you, and I'm praying for the youth. Please don't lie to them. Meaning, if you say, I'm going to pray for you, I'm praying for the youth, pray for them. Pray for the youth. They need it, and they're doing great. Uh, now, parents, just be aware there's dates that are coming up, deadlines that are coming up. Stay abreast of what's happening with your kids. It's exciting. It's a good thing. They, they communicate through Facebook. They communicate through different things. Uh, or, or, or rather via email, I should say. I think they have an Instagram as well. I'm not certain, but yeah, they do. So we love to see them uh, enjoying each other's company. And, and uh, uh, just to say, the youth are doing very well, and I'm excited for it. I'm happy for it. Uh, amen. We're wanting to get back to discipleship, and we were doing our small groups, life groups. I've always enjoyed uh, being a part of a small group, a life group. Whenever I'm able to be a part of that, um, I really enjoy it. It's, it's nice. It's, it's time where you can, just in a small group, be more intimate. You can share your thoughts. You can share your heart. You can ask questions that you couldn't ordinarily do on a Sunday morning. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an important thing to be involved in. So if you're able to host it, 
with your house, with you have some space, be ready, be thinking about that. Maybe you want to share something. Maybe you want to be somebody that actually speaks or, or lead a group and you're thinking, what about this topic? Can we, can we broach this topic? Let us know. Let us know. Let, we, can, we can prepare for it. We can, we can get that. We'll have an array of su subjects, I'm sure. That's going to kick off on after Easter. It's going to kick off after Easter and go six weeks. It's going six weeks into May, so that'll be good. Amen. Finally, I want to encourage you to give. Um, giving is part of worship. Giving is part of worship. Um, it used to be that uh, we used to pass out a little basket. We used to pass out, and that was fine. That was absolutely fine for then. Um, but in the, in the interest of saving some time, saving those minutes to be able to minister, we did away with that. There's a, there's a, a box in the back. There's um, a box on the side. As well, you can give online. If you notice in front of you, there is a giving card. There's a card that will help you, assist you to give online. Um, all of that's important. And the reason I'm saying it's a part of worship is because when you give, it's not we're asking for your money. It's you're giving and you're honoring God through it, and God gets blessed by it. It is part of worship. When I give, when I give, it blesses me. Am I, am I blessing the recipient? Yes, I'm blessing the recipient, but I'm blessed because I'm giving it away. I've been blessed by people that gave me things or gave me gifts. You know, I'm going to embarrass him. He's not even here today, so I'm going to embarrass him anyway. Dave Pace. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Dave. Dave's a big guy, sits in the back, usually in the corner with his mom. He brings his mother, and he's faithful to do that. And he has recently um, blessed me with a, like a jacket or something. And he had given me like a sweatshirt before. I, find my, I found myself the other day dressed in Dave Pace apparel. I'm like, how did this happen? Everything I had on, he got me over the years. And, and I was like, man, he's, he's, you know, I'm so blessed by him. He, he doesn't have to, but he thinks about me. I, I thought that was very sweet. You know, I, I, have to, I have to give props to Sister Gloria, you know, because she is best carrot cake maker in the world. Do not ask her for a carrot cake because that will take her energy off of me. I need those carrot cakes coming in my direction. I had to fight my wife off a little bit for, for that carrot cake. It was good. It was good, wasn't it? Anyway, moving right along. That's unimportant. What, what was I talking about? Oh, giving. That's right. Giving. I was talking about giving. <laughs> Listen, when you give, it blesses you. It blesses you. It's not just, it's not just a directive in, in Scripture, uh, but it honors God. And I want to encourage you this morning to give in your tithe, to give in your offering. And we'll be, talk, we'll be teaching on that soon. It's coming up. Your tithe is 10% of what comes in. We'll be teaching on that, and your offering is above that, above and beyond whatever you feel to give. And also, I want to accentuate, especially now because it's coming up, our missions trip. Um, in our missions giving, man, what a blessing it is to go to another country, see how they live, and be able to say, we were able to help them build this facility that they're working on. We were able to add monies to their building fund, which right, as of right now, we're sending 10000 I. I I think we could send more than that in the future. I, th I believe we can do much better than that. But I want to encourage you, uh, don't forget to give. Now, there's a letter uh, that Dave Hearn, Brother Dave, uh, he heads up our missions department, and uh, it is a, it, it's a giving letter. I want you to pick one up on the way out. He's holding them up right now. He's standing over there in the dark. He's been so faithful to our missions program for so long. I appreciate him so very much. His heart is for missions. And um, so pick up a letter on the way out, and don't forget to give to missions. If you want your missions giving to go to the building fund. Just put BF in big capital letters, BF missions, and we'll know that you mean it to go for the building fund. And that would be, that would be a blessing. It would help us to recoup some of that money because that $10,000, we just sent it from the church. And that comes from your offering. It comes from, we're able to bless others because you're a blessing. I hope you know that. I hope you understand that. So I'm hitting it kind of hard because that's true. We're able to bless all kinds of people, all kinds of places, because you've been a blessing. That's, that's awesome. I'm, I'm proud of you. I really am. Um, amen. Well, with that all said, it's time to introduce our guest speaker. And I've been blessed by them, uh, Christian. And Amanda does a fantastic worship. I lost her. I think she's still, oh, there she is. Um, she does a fantastic job with worship. And uh, while I was away, I know that Pastor Christian uh, got the opportunity to, to preach here, and I got the opportunity to listen. I've never actually heard him speak live, so I'm ready back there with my rotten tomatoes and everything. But no, I've heard him speak um, through Facebook and through our, our video, and I, I'm so blessed by both of them. We love the Bowers, we do. And I want to encourage you, pray for them, keep them in your prayers. Um, would you come bless us? Thank you, sir. That water's yours, by the way. 
That's all yours. In case you need it. Good morning, everybody. Good Works. I don't know. I'm not going to sound as good as Amanda. My name is Christian. I'm Amanda's husband. Uh, I've had the, the pleasure of being married to Amanda now for uh, 21 years. Uh, says that uh, our treasure is in heaven. Some of us get it on earth. Clearly, Amanda is going to get hers in heaven, but uh, um, I, I'm appreciative that I got mine early. Um, it's just an honor and a privilege to be with you guys. Uh, we love the Ravaggi family, uh, the Italianos. Uh, Abner and Amy are super special to us. They went through our Ground Zero School of Discipleship. And so um, every time we get to be here, it's really more like just uh, getting a chance to be with our family uh, than visiting another church. And so uh, we thank you. Uh, and I pray that this morning, uh, as I share from the Word of God, and we're going to get a lot of the Word of God. The Bible says that the Word of God never comes back void. Uh, but many times my words do. And so we're going to take an adventure into the Word of God this morning. But uh, before we do, I just want to pray with you. So if you bow your heads. Lord Jesus, I thank you for an amazing time of worship. God, I believe that in worship, there's a prophetic nature to it. God, sometimes worship is a, a, a praise report. We're thanking you for all that you have done. Praising you for all that is going on. God, sometimes our worship is a prayer request. We know who you are. We've paused long enough to remember and we have reason to praise you. So Lord, whether we're in this room with the praise reports or the prayer requests, I pray that as we go into your word this morning, that not a single one of us leaves here the way we arrived, that we would leave transformed by the power of your word because of your love. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I have a coach. I think if you want to do anything significant in life, you, you have to have a coach. That's what my coach says. And so I'm really just quoting my coach, but uh, he says that all readers can be leaders. But if you're going to be a leader, you must be a reader. First and foremost, you need to read God's word. We can't know his heart. We can't know his will. We can't know his way. We can't possibly understand his timing or his faithfulness without reading his word. And so let me encourage you, this is not even in the notes. Uh, let me encourage you, open the word. What you read, you may not understand. But when we lack wisdom, we can ask God who gives generously to all of us without finding fault. Find a friend, ask them to help you. Go to a leader, go to a pastor. But I'm telling you now, your journey will be much more difficult you will find yourself lost and often stranded without the Word of God. And so this morning, we're going to dive into a bunch. But um, I'm reading a book entitled, Good Leaders Ask Great Questions. It's a book by John Maxwell. He's a leadership guru. And uh, so this morning, I thought I'd begin by asking a couple of questions. Question number one. If you're a Bible quizzer, question number one. Multiple part question, 10-point ten ten answer. Someone's got the buzzer going off already. That's awesome. All right, here we go. Question. When someone prays for patience, does God immediately give them patience? Or does God give them the opportunity to be patient? Hear that. Does he give it immediately or he gives them the opportunity? That is so awesome. That's my daughter's phone going off over there. And she's like, I don't know how to make it stop. Uh, number question number two. If they pray for courage, hallelujah. <laughs> if you pray for peace and silence, sometimes it comes immediately. No. If they pray for courage, does God give them courage instantly? Or does he give them opportunities to be courageous? Yeah. First of all, praying for patience is a silly, 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 silly prayer. Because uh, there's only one way to get it. You know what I'm saying? By definition, you just ask the Lord to put you on pause. Hallelujah. When you pray for courage, you're saying, Lord, put me in a situation where I have nothing else but to depend on you. When you're praying for patience, you're praying for courage. They always lead you back to him. I have to wait on you. 
I have to trust in you because you are the source of my life. Hear that. You are the source of my life. There's nothing in me that's good except for you. And so when I ask those things, I'm really saying, God, reveal yourself in me. Question number three. If they pray for love, does God zap them with the warm and fuzzies? Wouldn't that be great for that person at work? You know who I'm talking about. Like, Lord, help me to love them. And instantaneously, there was like warm and fuzzies. Bro, if I could pray that and my wife would feel that instantaneously some days, that'd be awesome. But normally it helps us have opportunities to be loving and serving. For God, oftentimes the way is through. Hear that and be encouraged this morning for some of you guys who are going through. Oftentimes the way is through. And the reason why the way is through the reason why he leads us through the valley of the shadow of death is so that we die to our flesh and become alive in him. So there's less of us and more of him. And we're going to journey through that this morning. So this morning I'm asking, I set you up a little bit with my three questions. This morning I'm going to ask for your patience. I'm going to ask for your courage. And I'm going to ask for your love as we journey once again into the word of God. The title of my message this morning is Prove It. Everybody say, Prove It. You ever your kid growing up? Prove it. You know what I'm saying? We, and back in my day, we called that pulling your punk card. Someone would say something that sounded really cool. I'm like, I'm going to pull that punk card. Prove it. Now, sometimes I was confrontational. I didn't always love Jesus. Uh, sometimes I was like, prove it. I don't believe it. My brother had a supernatural gift of telling me things that I would believe that would not be correct. <laughs> Only to find out way too late that he was, like, definitely pulling my leg. But the thing I love about God is anytime you challenge him to show you he is who he says he is and he does everything he promises to do, he does it. He just does it. Does God have to prove anything to us? No, but do you know why he does? It grows our faith. Faith by definition is being sure of what we hope for, that he is who he says he is and he does everything he promises to do. It's being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we can't see. He has no problem proving it to us because he's never been proven wrong. Think about that. When you know you're right, do you ever have a problem proving it? When you know you're accurate, you ever been in an argument and you know you're right? You're like, oh. Doesn't happen often with my wife, but sometimes I know Google is going to help me. It's going to do what I like to call confirm that I wasn't wrong. I'm not going to say I'm right because that's a different argument, but I'm going to say that I wasn't wrong. Right? And I'm excited. I'm like, Google it. You ever play Scrabble with some people who come up with some stuff? You know what I'm saying? Like, listen, we should not be lying. That's a sin in church. So I like to pull out that, type in that dictionary word. That's not correct, spelled wrong. When you know you're right, you have no problem proving it. God loves proving it because he knows every time he proves himself, every time he shows himself, every time he reveals himself, something changes our doubt begins to go. Our fear begins to go. Our worry begins to go. Our faith continues to be strengthened. The definition of prove, because I like me some Scrabble, is to demonstrate the truth or existence of something by evidence or argument. Scripture shows us God proves his love for us as we journey with him. Now listen, I'm promising you we're going to allow scripture. Romans 5, 8, up on the screen. God proves his love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. He proved he loved you when he chose you at your worst. It's easy to love someone at their best. It's easy to clap and cheer and be in their corner when things are going well. It is much different when they're your enemy. It is much different when they hate you. It's much different when their entire life is set up against you. On your worst moment, on your worst day, in the worst situation you have ever been in, God looks from heaven and says, I'll choose her. I love him. But love comes at a cost. And we'll talk about it in just a moment. If we zoom out of that one verse, because I don't like ever take one verse out of context, we zoom out a little bit, we go to Romans 5, 6 through 8. For at just the right time, everybody say right time. Right. Who gets to determine the right time? This is a free question. Do you get to? Yeah. How many guys think sometimes God's timing is 
mm, not convenient. Anybody here? Anybody? Yo, sometimes you need worship. Guys, listen, my wife and I are on this wild journey with Jesus. We're like Abraham and Sarah. We're about to set off not knowing that where we're going. We don't have any answers. We got lots of questions. Our faith is strong, but our emotions and our thoughts are like, what? He has no problem proving to us that at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's you and me. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God proves his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The difficulty with memorizing scripture sometimes is it becomes familiar to you. And familiarity breeds contempt. And not in the way that you don't agree with it or you're arguing against it. It just becomes so familiar that you take it for granted. You know this is true when someone loses a loved one. Because it's not the, the greatest moments of their journey. It wasn't the, the most loving moments of their life that they remember. It's normally the weird things, the awkward things, the things that would frustrate them, the things that they would argue about or laugh about. It's those little things that are so powerful in our lives. Don't skip over that verse because it may be familiar to you. But he proves his love for us in this. While we were sinners, it's a huge word. He died for us. Romans 6.23 says it this way, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, gifts are free, can't be bought, can't be purchased, can't be earned, that's called payment, that's called salary. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Why was such a high paid, uh, uh, price paid? Because the reward is eternal. The reward is life. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Again, it becomes a familiar verse. We teach it to children. We can rattle it off and put it on posters. But God so loved you that he gave his one and only son. Anybody in here with children? Have you ever loved someone enough to sacrifice that kid? Have you ever loved someone who treated you horribly? Was an enemy to you? Openly despised you and ridiculed you? Lived in absolute defiance of everything you believed in? And then were willing in that moment to sacrifice the most precious gift of your life? I'm a dad. I'm a dad of a daughter, 18-year-old girl. I'm a dad of a son, a 13-year-old boy. I'm a fur baby dad. I got two fur puppies. I wouldn't even sacrifice my fur puppies. Listen, Riley is new, right? Penny is real new. We've only had him for two years. But I straight up will tell you, if there's a car bailing down, daddy's going to go meet Jesus before I let the puppies get hit. How serious must the cost have been? How deep must the love have been for him to prove that love to us by giving us Jesus? Don't limit him to Easter Sunday, a bunny and some eggs. That was quite the sacrifice. So God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so whoever believes in him, you and I, should not perish, but have eternal life. Sometimes we get familiar with 16, but we forget 17. Look at that. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. I think the biggest sin of the church universally, not this church, all churches, all fellowship, all brothers and sisters in Christ, the biggest sin we commit is that we condemn the world on a regular basis. Hear this. He didn't come into the world to condemn it. It stood condemned and dead already. Jesus sent his, uh, God sent his son into the world to save the world through him. Jesus did not come to make bad men better. It's not new and improved. And anytime you see that in the grocery store, really what it means is you're getting less product in a smaller, fancier box. I love the Girl Scouts. God bless those little girls. I'm for real. God bless those. Every time I see those girls, I get a tear in my eye and my wallet literally shrinks. Right? They have the most delicious treats. Probably not good for me, but man, those Samoas, hallelujah. 
I pray for the whole country of Samoa when I'm eating those things. I'm like, Lord, we're going to turn it into a missions trip. I feel the same way about M&Ms. I want to be missions-minded. Anyway, I'm just trying to redeem it. I'm trying to redeem it. But I love those girls, man. I love them. And they got the delicious treats. And you're like, oh, that's amazing. But you're going to sacrifice something. You're going to sacrifice something. Now those boxes are smaller. Have you noticed? There's less cookies. Even them cookies are smaller. I don't know if they're trying to help me like with my waistline. Maybe they're trying. Maybe it's a ministry and I just don't know it. But it seems like the price has gone up and the new and improved has not necessarily gone up as well. He didn't come to make us better. He came to make dead men live. So how do we receive this life? Listen to me. You were never that good that you didn't need to get saved that much. Uh, this is a note to those of you who grew up in church. You grew up around church. You, you grew up familiar with church. It took as much of the blood of Christ and as much of a sacrifice of Christ on the cross to save you as it took to save me, and I was filthy and horrible. We all needed saved. It wasn't like you needed a little saved and I needed a lot saved. We are all dead. Dead is dead. You're not like partly dead. This is, this is not the princess bride. You're not nearly dead. It's not true love, you know? No, no, no. We're all dead, 100%. So how do we receive this gift? Look at Romans 10, 9 through 11. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Pause for a moment and let that sink in. You will be saved. It's no doubt he'll prove it. Confess with your mouth and believe with your heart. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Guys, this is a love letter. We just came out of uh, Valentine's Day. Guys, if you did it right, come on, let them know. Girls, we need to know too. I saw a video online. Most men receive their first flowers in life at their funeral. How tragic. How tragic that the flowers that adorn my grave, that rest on my coffin, may be the first flowers that I get. I'm not talking about greenery. I'm talking about the power of love and appreciation. These are love letters. When I was trying to date my wife, guys, listen, you had to go all out, bro. I mean, she's a beautiful lady. She's very talented. I'm clearly neither one of those things. I had to work. I promised her, look, Beauty phase and talent can go. Hilarious is forever. <coughs> I'll be funny till we both drop. Praise the Lord. We'd be on in some wheelchairs rolling around the home. I won't look great, but I'll make you laugh. Praise God. But I have every note and card Amanda ever gave to me. Every one. They're in a box. I'm sentimental that way. But when I was trying to date her, I made some mixtapes. You know what I'm talking about. Anybody got mixtapes up in here? For those of you who are like not born anytime or early, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, mix, they had these little plastic cassettes with like tape and you had to pencil and, and twist them. And you would record your favorite songs and then you hook whoever you loved up with them. You're like, that's how I feel about you. <laughs> if you listen to that whole thing, clearly we're going to be together forever. Now, I mean, Amanda and I didn't get back together. I didn't get together during the mixtape. I made a mixed CD. Whoop, whoop. I'm like, let's go. CDs last longer. Last how. But I did. I made her a mixed CD. I'm like, listen to this when you're traveling. Think about me. Right? Do you know he wrote down all the love letters? The Ten Commandments are really not ten thou shalt nots. They're ten I love yous. I love you so much. Why would you waste your time? Why would you waste your time in searching for another God? I love you so much. Why would you break relationship through lying or stealing or coveting? I promise to, for, uh, to forgive you. I promise to meet all of your needs. Why would you chase any? I love you. I love you. I love you. In Revelation, there's letters to the church, and they seem like they're awful tough. They're corrective. But the Bible says if you have a child and you don't discipline it, you don't love it. My pastor preached a sermon on the letters to the church and, and, and uh, Revelation, and he called them Jesus' love letters. If I love you, I'll tell you the truth. God tells us the truth over and over and over in his, in his word. Here's a note of caution as we're talking about how much he loves us. 
let us be careful when you have been saved for a while. Who's been saved longer than a year? Longer than five years? Longer than 10 years? Longer than 20 years? I'm going to find out your age. I apologize. Longer than 30 years? Anyone longer than 40 years? Any longer than 50 years? If you're over 50 years, come on, somebody. I'm not going to keep going because that exposes a whole lot, but can you imagine five decades of following Jesus? Five decades of knowing his love? But sometimes we forget that there was a moment when we didn't. We forgot that he had to prove it to us once a long, long time ago. And then when we feel like we have arrived, sometimes we find ourselves with a stone in hand, ready to punish the sinners. Rather than remembering that the mission we're on is to set captives free. Hear this, we're... We're, we're prison stormers. We're supposed to be storming prisons and setting captives free. We're not executioners. We're not about killing the people that have sinned and have disappointed God and have offended us. Does that mean that sin's not wrong? Does that mean that sin's not horrific? Does that mean that sin doesn't break our hearts? Yes, but let it break your hearts and turn you to intercession. Let it break your heart and turn you to love. Remember, if you want love, he gives you opportunities to serve and show love. Most often, he's sending you to the unloved and the unlovely. Love is most powerful where it's least present. How do I know? For God so loved the world that he sent his son. Amen? It's a powerful thought. I know, I know. Listen, remember, we're on a rescue mission. We can't be distracted by the detestable nature of sin that we forget it's actually killing those it's enslaving. If we're turning on, on, on the Super Bowl and we see uh, God gets us and we're frustrated because of the message isn't real, then are we sharing the real message everywhere we go? He does get it. He knows that outside of Jesus Christ, we're lost in sin and death and there's no hope and there's no rescue. He, get, he got it. So he sent his son to rescue us. He calls us the church. He gives us new life, right? He proves it to us by giving us new life so that we can use it to bless others. That's powerful. The life he's given you in this life is not to entertain you or to make you better. It's to make you live, to live for him, to be a beacon of life to those who are lost in the darkness. A triage doctor must deal with the most life-threatening issue first. Salvation has to come before sanctification. Two fancy words. Dead has to come alive before the new life gets cleaned up. You don't get cleaned up and come to Christ, it's impossible. There's nothing good in you. You don't even come to Christ on your own. No one comes to the Father unless who? The Holy Spirit draws them. Holy Spirit draws them. We love them. We serve them. God transforms them. That's how it goes. Here are the roles. Holy Spirit draws them. We love and serve them. In whatever condition they are currently in, God transforms them. If you're frustrated because you haven't seen transformation, ask him to see it. But don't ask too quickly because we haven't got to point number two yet. Sin and slaves. Offense separates and delays. Salvation reunites us to God. Be encouraged. You were once lost, but now you are found. I love the story of the blind man. Who was he? Who is he? He goes, look, I don't know. This is what I do know. I once was blind, and now I see. It's baby steps. It's progressive. It's a movement. It's a journey. It happens one second, one moment at a time. You don't travel with Jesus for 50 years without one second at a time. It's powerful. God proves it to us by giving us life. Point number two, God proves it to us by transforming us. I love, uh, first of all, I read many different translations because some things are said better in certain translations than another, and they just use different words. My wife loves the Amplified because it says it in every way, in, in one page, uh, and it just it has like a little like parentheses and like 17 different cool ways of making that sound better, and she's like, oh, I love that. 
it? I'm like, that's great, but I, got, I only have so long for my message. And so I'm in the New King James on this one. Matthew 4.19 says it this way. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Other translation says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Our job is to come to him and follow him. We can't come to him without the Holy Spirit, but following him is 100% our choice. Hear me, the Holy Spirit draws us. Our job is to receive. It's a gift. You got to receive the gift. Our job is to follow. Where are you going? Right now on my journey, I don't know where God is going, but I do know this. If I put him in front and tuck him behind, I'll never be lost. If you're in your journey with Jesus right now and you just don't know what he is doing, you're not sure where he's going, you're in life and you don't know what the future holds, I promise you this, if you will tuck in behind him, you will never get lost. Sometimes the only way is through. And in, in just the right time, he will reveal his will to you, which may create inside of you patience and courage along the way. So we come, we follow, he transforms. Transformation's a movement, it's not a moment. In a moment, everything changed. I was a sinner and now I'm saved. I asked Jesus to come into my heart, I received his love for me, and immediately I was translated, I was taken out of the kingdom of darkness, sin and death, and given new life. But the journey with Jesus began right there. Salvation isn't the finish line, it's the starting line. Every moment after that is the journey with Jesus. It happens steadily and consistently over time. James 1, 2 through 4 says it this way, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face the trials of many kinds. Ugh, trials. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops or produces perseverance. Everyone wants a testimony, but they only come after a test. Hear me. Have you ever heard someone's testimony and you're like, wow, that's such a good testimony. You've heard a praise report. Wow, that's so amazing. Those only come after the test. You don't get a testimony and skip the journey. You don't get a testimony without going through. You have a testimony because he has brought you through. Testing of your faith develops perseverance in verse 3. Let perseverance finish its work. Back to patience. Oh, Lord, encourage. So that you may mature, complete, not lacking anything. Those words, mature, means he found me the way I was and he gave me new life. And as I journey with him, he proves his love to me in this. He doesn't leave me the way he found me. But as I remain close to him, what happens to me is that there's less of me and more of him. I think about it like a sculpture. Is the finished product always inside already? Yeah but it takes an artisan's hand to remove all the excess to reveal it. The Michelangelo, amazing sculpture. It was always in there, but it took an artist's eye and skilled hand to say, I'm gonna remove everything that doesn't belong in order to reveal it. What is he revealing in you? The work is still going on. Do you know how I know? Because whether you've been journeying with him 50 years or more, or five seconds. You got saved early in the message. That's awesome. I'll pray with you later. We're still in process. We're not done with the process until we go home. The Bible says the three greatest things are faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of them is love. Why are faith and hope not as important? Because you don't need them when you're in heaven. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you don't see. You're not hoping anymore. You're present with the Lord. You're not hoping for something. You're absolutely receiving it face to face. Hear that. The faith. It's, it's, we're no longer saying, I, I, I believe you are who you say you are, and I believe you can do it. No, we're standing before him in the presence. The only thing that is left is love and adoration. Hear that. But until that moment... He is working in us and through us and taking things off of us to reveal himself more to us and to the world. I love my wife. Good news, right? But my love for her deepens and matures as we spend years together. 
Every day, month, year, every time we journey together, my love for her grows more. The same is true as I journey with Jesus. I love him more because he reveals more of himself to me. His love for me never changes. He loved me when I was a sinner. It never increases or decreases. He was all in and gave me his son. My capacity to love him changes as I journey with him. Your love to your capacity to love him increases as you get to journey with him. Your testimonies begin to, to stack up. Your faith grows stronger because he's brought me through so much. How could he not bring me through this? When COVID hit and shelves were bare, I took my daughter to Walmart and I said, baby girl, what are you thinking when you're seeing all these empty shelves? And she looked at me with the most beautiful little angelic face and God has brought our family through some stuff. She looked at me with absolute sincerity. She goes, daddy, Jesus has brought us through so much already. Surely he can bring us through this. The faith of a child. She paused to remember she had reason to praise. She was no longer fearful or afraid. She goes, Daddy, I've watched him do miracles. Surely he can do it again. Powerful. Powerful. Our love will mature and grow the more we journey with him. Peter's a great example of this. Peter was bold and brash and prone to speaking without thinking. But by journeying with Jesus, he was transformed. Peter walked on water and participated in miracles. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people were added to the church. Dude, most of the time when Peter was speaking, there were 11 other dudes going, oh my gosh, does this guy ever shut up? I believe the walking on the water when Peter's like, if it's you, call me out there. And the boys are like, yeah, call him out there, Lord. Can't wait to watch this one. Yeah, go ahead, Pete. Can't imagine the, the jaw dropping when Peter's like, woohoo! We pick on Peter because he started to sink. But 11 other guys didn't know what it was like to walk on water. 11 other guys didn't know what it was like to be in absolute need. And instantly, immediately, the Bible says, had the hand of Jesus reach out. Jesus didn't translate Peter back into the boat, they walked back. They climbed back in. That's pretty awesome. As he journeyed with Jesus, God continued to pro prove his love to Peter with new experiences, new opportunities. So let's look at 2 Peter 2, 1 through 11. Simon Peter, a servant of the apostle Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Peter says a lot about his journey with Jesus in those first two verses. But check out verse number three. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. The man who wants denied out of fear. The man who wants open mouth and insert foot a lot. Makes the most powerful statement. He says, his divine power, the power of God, the love of God has given us everything we need. There is no resource that's kept from you. You are a child of the king. Every resource of heaven is available to you to live out a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promise so that through him, everybody say through him, you can do nothing on your own. But through him, you may participate in his divine nature. The divine nature of God is love. It is to give. It's to give life. It's to transform. It's to empower you. To be a blessing to others. We get to participate in that divine nature. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, we're going to focus right here. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And to goodness, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And self-control, perseverance. Oh, that word again. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, mutual affection. And to mutual affection, love. Some of you guys are like, that was a lot of words, bro. Faith is the foundation on which we grow spiritually. It's believing he is who he says he is and he does everything he promises to do. Goodness. It's a life of strong character and discipline. You cannot have a life of strong character and discipline in a moment. But it can be a movement and a journey. It can have some hills and valleys, some oopsies, 
David was a man after God's own heart. David sinned in prolific ways. Ask Uriah. David repented really well. David asked forgiveness. Repenting doesn't mean saying I'm sorry. It means turning and going the other direction. A life of godliness. Wow. Knowledge and understanding of what God thinks and values. You cannot know what he thinks and what he values without going to his word because it's the only place he tells us. The Holy Spirit won't tell you anything that's not written in here. They confirm one another. Jesus didn't say anything he didn't hear the Father saying. Didn't do anything he didn't see the Father doing. He said, I only do what Daddy tells me to do. Knowledge comes through his word. Self-control, the ability to lead oneself before leading others. Oftentimes we say, do as I say and not as I do. But self-control says, I will lead myself before I even try to lead others. Perseverance, the ability to be patiently stick to what is right. Doing the right thing because it's the right thing and sticking to the right thing regardless of consequences. Perseverance. Godliness is spirit-filled, spirit-led lifestyle that reflects the Lord. None of these happen instantly. God just doesn't give you this. He has to create it in you. Brotherly kindness is that lifestyle of warm and relational caring. And finally, love. The quality that enables us to sacrificially give to others. Guys, this happens in increasing measure. Verse 8, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. How many guys don't want to be ineffective or unproductive in the kingdom of God or in your own life or in your own marriage, in your own parenting, in your own job? If you'll dedicate yourself to allowing the Lord to do these things in you, you will neither be ineffective or unproductive. But the only way is through. So if you're asking for effectiveness and you're asking for productivity, he's going to make you more like himself. Because what he wants you to be effective in doing and productive in doing is reflecting his love to others. But number nine, but whatever, but whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. If you're not where you want to be right now, don't worry. It's not about perfection. God's not asking us to be perfect. He's asking us to be willing to be perfected. No sculpture is perfect out of the gate. It becomes perfected as he removes things. He is the architect. He is the artist. He is the potter. We are the clay. I need to continue to put myself before him in prayer and in his word and say, God, search my heart and know me. If there's any wicked or unrighteous way in me, take it out. Forgive me and lead me to be more like you. Guys, it's all about him. Don't worry. Philippians 1.6 says this, and we're coming to a close, I promise. Philippians 1.6 says this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The work will continue until he calls you home. Can I talk to my saints seasoned with salt? Those of you who have seen more years than others, he's not done. He's not done. 33 years he lived in absolute obscurity. Three years he did a lot. Hear me. If you have walked this planet for a while and you're still here, he's not done. There are lives to be transformed. There is love to be shown. There is still more work that he wants to do in you, not just through you. Spend some time asking him what the journey ahead looks like and not when it will end. Don't spend so much time looking back that you forget that there's still more miles ahead. Amen? Well, I don't, I, you know, and it's, oh yeah. But everywhere we are, he is with us. So who are you around and how can you love them? How can you serve them? How can you show them the love of God? Church, listen. We come here to be equipped for ministry. Pastors, job, only job is to equip saints for ministry because I can't go where you go. I don't know who you know. I don't live where you live. But I know this, if God goes with you, transformation's coming. Life is on its way. How do I know that? Because he promises you and empower you to do it. Listen, a tax collector became a gospel writer. A demon-possessed man became an evangelist. A Roman centurion, centurion an absolute occupier and devourer of, of nations 
who was hailed as being a man of great faith because of Jesus. An adulterous woman became a disciple. The blind could see, the lame could walk, and the deaf could hear again. Oh yeah, and the dead came back to life. That's what he does. That's what he does, and he asks us to participate in the journey. Point number one was God proves it to us by giving us life. Point number two, God proves it to us by transforming us. And point number three, he does it through empowering us. Everybody say power. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. He gives us the power to be a witness, to tell the good news. When Jesus was on the earth, Jesus was on the earth. Jesus could only be where Jesus was and with whom Jesus was. He said, is it better for you that I would go away and send you the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit can be in all of us everywhere at once. And the presence of God in us transforms atmospheres around us if we invite him to do so. I remember they said even if we kept our mouths shut, the rocks would cry out. I don't want a rock to cry out in my place. I want to testify of the glory of the Lord and what he's done in my life so that others might know him. Church, listen, we don't come on Sundays to be entertained. That's a waste of time. We come here to be equipped to go into a world that's dying and enslaved to sin. He promises to give us life here on earth and eternally. He promises to transform us so we can better reflect him to the world around us. Even the dimmest of light shines brightly in the darkest of rooms. I was a tour guide in a cavern. Absolute darkness, like no light. Teeny wee little flashlight as an illustration. And we turn on this teeny wee little flashlight and we could see everybody in the whole room. It wasn't a powerful light, it was just on. He's not asking you to be Billy Graham. He's not asking you to be Pastor Jimmy. He's not asking you to be anyone but who he's created you to be. Because he's uniquely created you to impact the world that he's placed you in. How cool is that? Well, Pastor, I don't even know. Do you know the love of Jesus? Then just share that. Can you love someone? Can you serve someone? Can you not reject them and be offended by them enough to care for them and their needs and know that their sin is killing them? Then do that. He does the transforming. 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4, if we look back, his divine power has given us everything we need for godly life. It allows us to participate in the divine nature. That's powerful, guys. Not only have we received power to be witnesses, we've received power to live godly lives. There's nothing more loud of a testimony than when you have integrity and you live out what you say. Anybody know some good talkers? And they're not talking wrong, they just talk. Anybody know who guys who don't talk much but they live it out? Who do you respect more? Who would you follow more, follow more quickly? Sometimes you need to preach the gospel everywhere you go. Sometimes you use words. Sometimes you just live your life. Integrity shouts loudly to a world that doesn't have any. Love and mercy and grace. Love your wife. Love your kids. Do great in your job. Whatever your job is, do it with all of your heart. Why? Because you stand out and they want to know what's different about you. And when you go about your normal business with the heart of God, you'll get opportunities because God will draw them to you so you can share why. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope you have, the Bible says. But do so with gentleness and respect. Live a life in integrity so that when you open your mouth, your life brings legitimacy to the message you're about to deliver. You guys are doing great. I know we're in bonus time. Here we go. How do we stay connected to the source? Acts 2, 42 and 43. The early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. you got to know the word. Guys, you cannot do this walk by yourself. The second thing they devoted themselves to was relationships, the fellowship. You have to have someone to walk with. Churches are so important because they give us family to journey with. Well, you know we're going to be together forever in heaven, right? Like even though y'all don't like somebody in here, you know what I'm saying? eternity forever we need each other it's the rough sandpaper that helps blocks of wood become smoother 
That person who irritates you to no end is great sandpaper in your life to help you become more like Jesus. Building those open, honest, spiritually encouraging relationships helps you reflect him better. The breaking of bread was really giving thanks. There were love feasts. We celebrated the Eucharist, all that he has done for us, having an attitude of gratitude. Pastor talked about it earlier. Your life will be blessed when you give because it's impossible to outgive God. He's already given you his son. You were never more like Jesus than when you give because by definition, it's a sacrifice of what you have for something greater. And to prayer, you have to ask him for help. And lastly, as we recap all of this, in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, in verse 18, or 18, sorry, we always do 19 and 20, but we leave out 18, so undervalued. Verse 18, then Jesus came to them and said this, all authority, everybody say authority. Come on, you're so with me. We're closing here, here. All authority in heaven and on earth. That's a lot of authority. That's all of it. I mean, that's pretty much all of it. He says, all authority, where? Everywhere. Has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. That word go means as you go, where you go, wherever you go, where, however you go, with whomever you're going. As you go, make disciples. You're like, well, how do I do that? Do I have to have a Bible study? Yeah. Let them see the Bible fleshed out in your life. Let them see the joy of the Lord shine upon your face. Let them see you go through hardship and adversity and questioning with faith and trust that God is who he says he is and will do all that he says he will do. When they're sick, you pray. You watch God do miracles. When they're hopeless, you become a friend and say, I don't know if I can solve a thing, but I can promise you, with me, you will not walk alone. It will cost you. It costs Jesus. Hear this. Love requires sacrifice. If you're going to do it, it's going to cost you. Time, mind, money, minutes. It's going to cost you something. But on the back end, the value was so worth it. Eternal reward. So therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. You cannot teach someone to obey that which you are disobeying. You cannot lead where you have not gone. You cannot give what you do not have. Jesus, help me be obedient first and foremost. God, if there's anything that's unsacrificed in my life, if there's anything unsurrendered, God, if there's anything of disobedience in my heart, please, God, take it out so that I can teach them how to obey. Through example, I grew up in a military household. Most things are better caught than taught. And there's nothing worse in a military than a leader who has all the authority, but none of the integrity. Anybody? Anybody? Do not think about your boss. Repent right now. Lord, set them free from those thoughts. Hallelujah. It may be accurate, Lord, but make it an intercession. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always. Here is the best line of the whole thing. All authority is his, and he bookends it with this. I'm going to be with you. I'm not sending you out. I'm like, go get him, tiger. Jesus is like, come on, let's go. Follow me. Right behind me. Every step of the way. Does God need to prove anything to any one of us? No. If he never blesses your life in any other way other than the salvation and eternal life he has already given you, he has far exceedingly and abundantly given you more than you could ask or deserve. But he loves to prove it to you. He loves to journey with you. He loves to send you out to help others follow him. It literally brings him great joy. You know what God's love language is? My love language is words of affirmation and quality time. My baby spends time with me and then tells me that, ah, you are the best. I'm like, I love you too. I just, I, I just need to hear. I just need to, I, God, I just need to remind me. Worship is that way. God, when I sing, I'm all bawling during the whole thing of worship because you have been faithful. I do fight my battles on my knees. The victory belongs to the Lord. You have brought me through everything. I cry because it's true. I need those words of affirmation. That's why he's always telling me how much he loves me. Quality time. I just want to spend time with you, God, in your presence, with you, with my wife, with my kids. I don't care what we're doing. I just want to be with them. You know what God's love language is? Have you ever asked? Obedience. God's love language is obedience. John says it this way. If you have my commands and you keep them, you love me. 
Why is obedience it? Because that word, man, obey, whoo, that's a, that's, a, mm, that's a $10 angry word. You get some fighting going over that. I'm not a dog. I'm not going to obey. But when we obey the Lord, we say this. You are who you say you are. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to you. If I will live my life the way you tell me to, it will be the best life I can have. When I obey God, I'm literally saying, I can trust you. Because I know that you love me. I can trust you because everything your way is the best way. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden is that they wanted to determine what good and bad was. Isn't that the problem of our world right now? We want to consider for ourselves your truth. When I obey, I say you're the way. You're the truth. You're the life. And when he is the way and he is the truth and he is the life, I experience the life he has to give. I experience the transformation he wants to create in me. And I'm empowered to not only live for him, but lead others to him. Would you guys stand with me as we pray this morning? I don't know where you are in the journey, but in this room, I'm guaranteeing you, some of you are asking God for life. Maybe there's been a hope or a dream that has died. Maybe you've heard all this and you have never decided to ask Jesus to be the leader of your life yet. You've got some things and you've got some reservations and you, you just haven't said, all right, I'm all in. If you're asking for life, he'll give it to you. But like those questions in the beginning, in order to receive his life, you have to offer up your own. In order to see the life that is in Jesus, you have to say, I want the life you have for me and you can have this one. Maybe you're here and you're saying, God, I need transformation. Transformation only happens when we allow him to remove the things in our lives that are not like him. You can only be touched by the artist when you're in his presence, in his word, in prayer, in the house of God, in worship. You got to spend time with him to be transformed by him in the same exact way. It's impossible to have an intimate relationship with anyone if you spend no time with them. But asking for transformation says this, you will change. He's not looking to suck out your personality, your likes, or your dislikes, but maybe he's going to. Maybe there's some stuff in your world that he's like, that's not me. Well, I'm Irish and we're feisty. Well, in your anger, do not sin. Or I'm Italian, we like to argue. Well, then argue for the good things. If you're going to have an argument, then let's fight for righteousness. Let's fight for love. Let's out-argue each other on who will serve the best and love the strongest. If you're going to ask for transformation, you have to be ready to be changed can't do that outside of his presence. And the last one, are you praying for empowerment? He will not give you what you will not use. Hear this. He will not give you what you will not use. If, he wants you, if you're asking him to empower you to live a godly life, then you need to take the steps to live it. If you want him to empower you to be a witness, then you need to open your mouth and share it. Here's the good news. It all depends on him. All of them are gifts. You can't earn it or deserve it. And he died literally for you to experience it. Church, what happens when all of us exchange our life for his? Commit to being transformed more into his image and likeness. That fierce love. The unquenchable desire to bless. What happens when we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit every day of our lives and not just on Sundays at services and look for the power of God to transform the atmospheres around us and not just wait to come in an atmosphere prepared for us. Amen. Let me pray with you. Lord, I thank you for my friends.
first of all, I thank you for, we asked for patience in the beginning and I went long, so <laughs> praise the Lord. God, we ask for courage. I ask them to give me courage, which says, Lord, this is scary stuff. It's changing my life for yours, allowing you to transform me and remove some things and talk to me about some stuff. God, empowering me to go and do some things. Whew. I don't know if that's my personality. I don't know if that's my wiring. But I know that you've given me my personality and my wiring and my circle of influence because of it. Circling back to the beginning, Lord, help us to be patient as you do the work. Help us to not give up doing the good things, loving and believing, serving. Jesus, you never gave up on us. You still don't. Help us not to give up on the lost and dying world around us. Help us not to give up on ourselves. Some of the worst critics in this room are the critics against themselves. God, help us to see how much you love us at our worst. And help us to embrace the love for you have for us right now when we're saying, God, I don't know how. But yes. Lord, my prayer before we started was that we would not leave this room the way we came in, but that we would leave transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, do your work. Do your work, Lord. Pastor Jimmy hit it. Amanda hit it. Let us not waste time. Let us not waste time. Let us invest it in the things that are eternal and impactful and beautiful and life-giving and transformative and empowering. You'll prove it if we just show up for it and allow you to do it. We ask this in Jesus' beautiful and precious name. And all my patient, courageous people in the room say amen. 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 God bless you, Pastor Jimmy. Amen. Amen. Before you go, Amanda, could you come up? First of all, every husband in this room is now waiting for roses. So, there's that. I appreciate your sense of humor and sharing the word the way that you guys have. Andrea, will you come? Um, and he, he, you definitely will be making Amanda laugh forever. Uh, he, when you mentioned Pastor Jimmy right after Billy Graham, I said, he's funny. That's, that's funny. That's hilarious. <laughs> but uh, listen, we want to, will, uh, will you pray with us? Just extend your hand. We want to bless them. We want to pray an anointing over them as well. Father God, we, we are so thankful for this family this ministry family. God, we thank you that at one point you transformed them and you've empowered them. And God, I pray that you would expand their territory, that you would allow an anointing like they've never felt before just to saturate them, oh God. I pray that you'd light their way, straighten their path. God, I pray that you'd give them strength. God, as you expand their territory, I pray that you'd give them ability to fill that thing with your love, with your grace, with your presence. God, where they go, let it be where you've led. God, I pray that you would allow them such great peace in your presence, such wisdom and insights beyond their own experience that will come straight from the throne of heaven that will help them and lead them and guide them into whatever stage you do. And I pray, God, for their kids as well, your protection, your, your blessing, your spiritual empowerment. God, whether they're 13 or 18, whether they're young or old, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just take a hold of them as well, that this whole family would be united in bringing the message of, of salvation. Jesus, we thank you that the message that we bring to those who need it. God, that's a family event. It's a family event, and I pray that they would be protected, blessed. I pray that everything that they touch would be blessed, God. God, I pray that when they come against hard times, lead them through it. When they come against hills, get them over it. Like, Holy Spirit, you are worthy, and we trust you. You're able, and we trust you. We entrust ourselves to you in every way. We pray a blessing and an anointing on them. God, thank you for their lives. Thank you for the, how they've been a blessing to us. We pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen and amen. 
Amen. Love you, man. Amen. God bless you. Um, we hope to see you on Tuesday. Amen. To join us in some games. We promise there will be no bloodshed, and it'll be fun, and it'll be a good time of fellowship. God bless you. Amen.